You know, there's something about the way that God has positioned us in the earth as his kids. There, there is something about understanding and recognizing the place, the declaration, the, the, the declarations of God on our lips, how, how significant and how important they are. You know, I, I, I've often marveled about Adam. You know, imagine if, if you were Adam and God breathed into your nostrils the breath of life. All of a sudden, you're breathing. You're in this brand new environment. You've got this loving father being that has just breathed life into you. And actually, when he created him, he, he gave him authority, dominion. He, he, he was on assignment to represent God in the earth and, and, and to subdue the earth, to bring it under the will of God. In other words, to release the kingdom, to extend the kingdom. Man was created, part of his purpose was to extend the kingdom wherever he went. And man was given authority over all of creation, over all of the earth. How was man to exercise that authority? Now, you could see if, if you know, there were some rabbits, rabbits in the cabbage patch, you know, you could just go chase them out of there. But what if you've got elephants in the beet patch? You've you got to have some other kind of authority other than a physical, the physical part of it. You have to be able to speak words that release God, that release kingdom, and that release purpose. You know, the, part of the reason that we make declarations together on Sunday morning is because I, I just have this conviction that that's what we're supposed to do. And, and it's not just a bunch of us saying a bunch of different things, but it's, it's a, a group of people coming together in declaration and unity and releasing things from heaven to earth. <clears throat> Praise God. Hey, today is Soap Sunday. I am, I'm always excited about this. We know that the word SOAP is an acronym, and it stands for Scripture, Observation, Application. It's, this is not a, a time that we invite you to come up on and preach on your favorite subject. It, it's not that. This is the time where we invite you to come and share what God has been saying to you personally in your, in your personal devotions with God. I think most all of us are, are reading the Bible on a, on a continual basis. We, we, we know the importance of exposing ourselves to the Word. So daily, we're doing that. And, and you, you discover, if, if you do it slow enough, now if you're just running through so you can check off your chapters, you may not experience this. But if you're reading your Bible to hear from God, what happens is you'll be reading, and all of a sudden, a, a verse, or maybe even a couple of verses, will kind of, kind of jump out at you. Now, in the busyness of life, it would be very easy to just kind of ignore that and say, well, I'll, I'll have to check that later, and then totally space it. But, but if, you're, if you're longing to hear God's voice, you're going to take that verse or verses, and you're going to write them out. Take the time to write them down, and, and in a prayerful way, say, Lord, what are you saying? What, what, what are you trying to show me? What, what do I observe? What are you trying to show me in this verse? And then, a, 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 again, this is a, this is a, a prayerful uh, task. I'm not just doing something. I'm, I'm leaning into the Holy Spirit because he's the only one that can really open the word. And he's the only one that can really show, it, show me how to apply it to my life. And so I... I the next, uh, the third part is application. Now, 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 how does this change things? How is this going to affect the way I think or the way I talk or the way I act? How is this going to change me? And then turning that all into a prayer that for me usually is just calling on God's help to help me put it into practice, to help me make it, the word become flesh to, to, to flesh it out in my life. So, I'm, you know, I made an invitation to, you know, everybody, you know, if you're not going to be in church on Sunday, send me a video of your soap. Nobody did. And so, um, and, and this, is a, this is a warning. 
Like, if you don't have soaps, I'm going to preach today. So weigh it out. Is there anybody that has a, a soap that they would like to share with us this morning? Jan, come on. Got an icebreaker soap? Yes, you are. Just because you need to know that you guys could do this too. <laughs> I, I'm not uh, a trained Bible teacher, you know, but we've, you know, we study on our own and you guys can do this too. <laughs> I'm reading out of uh, Luke chapter 1, 26 through 38, and I'm emphasizing verse 37. This is actually ending out being a life a verse for me, and there's several others that are really similar to it. This is talking about um, Gabriel coming to Mary and announcing Jesus' birth. And it says, during the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Elizabeth was, um, I believe, Mary's aunt. The angel Gabriel was sent from God's presence to an unmarried girl named Mary, living in Nazareth, a village in Galilee. She was engaged to a man named Joseph, the true descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to, uh, appeared to her and said, Grace to you, young woman, for the Lord is with you, and you are anointed with great favor. Well, Mary was deeply troubled. Mary was pretty young. I think she's, what, 15 around in there? 14 or 15, very young. She's deeply troubled over the words of the angel, bewildered over what this may mean for her. But the angel reassured her, saying, Do not yield to your fear, Mary, for the Lord has found delight in you and has chosen to surprise you with a wonderful gift. You will become pregnant with a baby boy, and you are to name him Jesus. He will be supreme and will be known as the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will enthrone him as king on his ancestor David's throne. He will reign as king of Israel forever, and his reign will have no limit. Mary said, but how could this happen? I am still a virgin. Gabriel answered, the spirit of holiness will fall upon you, and the almighty God will spread his shadow of power over you in a cloud of glory. This is why the child, bo yeah, sorry. The child born in you will be holy, and he will be called the son of God. But more, your aged aunt um, Elizabeth has also become pregnant with a son. The barren one is now in her sixth month. Not one promise from God is empty of power, for nothing is impossible with God. <laughs> then Mary responds, saying, This is amazing. I will be a mother for the Lord. As his servant, I accept whatever he has for me. Mary, everything you have told me come to pass and the angel left her the the scripture that god's been highlighting to me for a couple years now not one promise from god's from god is empty of power <laughs> thank god for nothing is impossible with god and i needed that word i didn't know how badly i needed that word uh, starting about two years ago um god kept bringing that phrase up to me for nothing is impossible with God. Well, I was going through an issue with my poor father being very ill and then passing away last year. Um, and financial things because of that. My own health uh, is a lot better than it was, but it's ongoing. And so I was facing many, many challenges. And I needed a Father God to keep reminding me my promises will never, never fail. And nothing is impossible with me. And I had many, 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 many times where he proved that to me. And one of the things that he did um, is he reminded me of a teaching. So I'm going into the observation part here. He reminded me of teaching I, I heard oh, quite a while back. And it comes out of messianiccedar.com. God provides thinking about how he took care of Israel. When they left, left Egypt, we know that when Israel came out, they were rescued uh, by the blood on the doorposts and the cross beam to be saved from the firstborn being killed. 
these guys had been um, slaves for over 400 years. And when they left, not one of them was feeble. That meant they'd been healed. That's amazing. We're thinking of two to three hundred million, two to three million people. Not one of them was ill. When they left, uh, the Egyptians had given them riches, you know, lots and lots of riches as they left. Uh, the some poor in scripture it says that their feet had not swollen in all of those 40 years they were in the wilderness. Their clothes did not wear out. That's amazing. That's amazing. And these guys, you know, they have a slave mentality and they're going through all this. So uh, somebody had done some research because we're looking at two to three million people. Moses and the people were in the desert, but what's, what's he going to do with them? He had to, they had to be fed, which requires a lot of food every day. The people needed 2,000 tons, 4 million pounds of food every day. Hmm. To bring that much food each day would require the equivalent of three freight trains each a mile long every day. That's a lot of food. <laughs> In the desert, they needed firewood to cook and keep warm. Every day, this would take about 4,000 tons, 8 million pounds of wood, which is a few more freight trains each mile long. That's a lot. Of course, they needed water. If they had only had enough to drink and wash a few dishes, it'd take 11 million gallons every day, which are a freight train with tank cars, 1,800 uh, 1, miles long just to bring water every day. And then another thing, they had to get across the Sea of Reeds in one night. And we're talking to, to 3 million people. If they went on narrow path, double file, the line would be 800 miles long, and we would cry, require 35 days and nights to get through. And they couldn't do that. They had the Egyptian army was following them. They had to get across in one day, <laughs> one night. So to do that, the opening of the, I guess it's called the Red Sea also, is three miles wide so they can walk 5,000 abreast to get over in one night. And that's on dry ground, by the way. Okay. So there's lots of miracles as part of that. Every time they camped at the end of the day, they needed a campground. Two-thirds the size of the state of Rhode Island, about 750 square miles to camp every day, every time they camped. And they journeyed that way for 40 years. So that's provision every day. So do you think he can take care of our stuff? <laughs> Do you think he can get you a job? I, I testified last week I got uh, new tutoring jobs because of COVID. Couldn't tutor up until this point. Uh, that started on Friday. I'm picking up, I think, three more students in the next two weeks. So God is helping with, with a lot of my needs. So what I've been doing, application, um, I've been meditating on things like this. If God had done it before for someone else who loved him, he will do it for us. If God did it for me, he will do it for you because he's no respecter of persons. He loves us. So when I struggle for help, sometimes I ask prayer from trusted friends. We need each other. Okay. I take scripture and convert it into prayers because God's word doesn't return to him void. If you really release his word, it will come back and it will have fruit with it. I try to obey God when he asks me to do something. And all of the miracles listed there, God had given them direction. Do this, and they did that. Do this, and they did that, and the miracle came. And then I meditate on scriptures that build my faith and, and, and speak them out loud. So, prayer. I'm going to pray with you, okay? Go ahead and pray with me. This is out of Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. Okay, so I kneel humbly in awe before you, Father God, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the perfect Father of every person in heaven and on earth. I pray that you will unveil with, uh, that you would, would unveil, uh, sorry, within us the unlimited riches of his glory and favor until and supernatural strength floods our innermost being with your divine might and explosive power. I pray that by constantly using our faith, the life of Christ will be released deeply inside of us 
and the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of our lives. May all of us be empowered to discover that every, that every holy one sorry, experiences the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. How deeply intimate and far-reaching is his love. How enduring and inclusive it is. Endless love beyond measure that transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pours into us until we are filled to overflowing with fullness of God. May all of us never doubt God's mighty power to work in us and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than anything we could, uh, that is our greatest request, our most unbelievable dream, and exceed our wildest imaginations. He will outdo do them all for his miraculous power constantly energizes us. Now, Lord Jesus, we offer up to you all glorious praise that rises from every church and every generation through Christ Jesus and all that yet will be manifest through time and eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Tana. Good job. My wife is reminding me I'm supposed to uh, sanitize this. Uh, who else would like to share a soap today? Dave, got, got it quick. Lynette, you're next. Come on, Dave. Got to be careful. Dave just jumps right out of his seat. I think that's on. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Great to see you. Um, such a blessing to be with the uh, forever family of God, whether you're here or China or wherever you're watching from. I'd like to just pray uh, for the word to lift up the name of Jesus. So, Father, we do come before you and ask that as we share your word, that it will go forth to lift up Jesus to give glory and honor and thanks to you because we, we recognize that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We ask, Abba Father, that you would wash us by the washing of the water with your word this morning to really purify our hearts, renew our minds, and to strengthen our faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen. This soap uh, came as a result of just the daily journey of life. You know, um, Deb and I were talking about that. That's just how life is. It's a journey, and it's not easy, but it's well worth it. And in the end, we get to have a forever family reunion, which is going to be really awesome. I'll be able to eat things that I've not been able to eat here because of allergies, whatever, and uh, enjoy it all. The scripture, James, if you would like to display it, is 1 John 3, 16. And it's in the NIV. If you can grab NIV, that'd be great. If not, no problem. This passage of scripture was brought to me by the Lord because I was really struggling. Um, the primary reason why I was struggling was because of summer break. Um, I know that might sound strange to you, but uh, my wife and I live with our daughter and her three children that are three, the, the two-year-old just turned three at the end of June, and a four-year-old and an 11-year-old. So our house is um, almost always in the state of some, some range of chaos. There's a lot of screaming, there's a lot of yelling, there's a lot of, you know, just playing and jumping off furniture and pulling things 
off the counter onto the floor. Just being real. <laughs> if you've been a parent or are a parent, you can relate. Okay, so um, so my life is different when school ends and I was distance teaching, so I was still going to school every day and teaching from school, but now I'm home and my stress is getting out of control. I don't want it to be out of control. I want to live a life of peace. I want to love well, especially my family. And so I found myself being impatient. Then I'd repent of that, but feel guilt and condemnation because I'm feeling impatient and I shouldn't be. For heaven's sakes, I'm 64 years old. I should have gotten over that by now. So anyway, our dear Lord uh, brought me back to look at Jesus. How did Jesus respond all the time? was always in love. He was always serving. And so this is how I know what love is. Jesus Christ willingly laid down his life for me, for all of us. And we, I, ought to lay down my lives for my family, friends, for the world, because that's really all-encompassing, but the brothers in Christ, particularly. I thought about different aspects of being a servant. Uh, the word barista came to mind, or barista. Maybe that's how you pronounce it, barista. And the primary job of a barista is what? What does a barista do? Yes prepare what the customer wants, right? Of a coffee uh, beverage. And what we are to serve is the fragrance of Christ. So my observation is, I feel like God's bringing me into a season of fresh revelation to repent. So what Robbie shared and what Jan shared, you know, what Crystal sang about is so important. We, we have to get a revelation from God to really understand. I need to get a revelation from God to really understand what I need to repent of. And then in faith, turn to him and believe him for change. I'm feeling the reality of Philippians 1.6 as well. During this season of my life, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in me and in you will carry it on to completion. And in that verse, I just see the hands of Jesus, you know, lifting us, carrying us until the work is finished. And I'm still being worked on, trust me. I'm sure you can tell. <laughs> but he's going to finish the work because he's faithful and he's able to do it perfectly. Part of this quick good work is me choosing to lay down my life for my family and my family of God in this earth in Jesus' name. So what does that look like? First, I have, to, I have to start with my father, because that's what Jesus did. So I have to press my ear against the chest of Jesus, listen to his heart, be quiet. Dave, just be quiet. Not you, Dave. I mean, me, Dave. Not you, Dave. Me, Dave. <laughs> Just be calm and be quiet and put those thoughts aside. Listen to the heartbeat of the Father. 
so that he may reveal to me why am I alive today? Why did God let me live another day? Why and what is my destiny today? What do you want me to do, Father? Then and next, I have to position my heart because that's my choice. That's my job. I have to position my heart to surrender all to him. I don't want to be in the way of God, and neither do you. We, we want to be used of God. Time is short, and there's a lot to do. So I need to choose faith in Jesus over how I feel at the moment. I might feel like I don't want to do that. And Jesus will say to me, that's okay. I didn't really want to die on the cross either. But, but his prayer, not my will, but thine be done. My prayer needs to be the same. Father, not my will, but yours be done. So when I'm finally quiet and calm in the presence of the Lord, I remember the awe-inspiring sacrifice of Jesus for me and for all humanity. That does touch my heart. And I look at his humility, his love, his courage, his tenacious affection for every one of us as believers in him. I feel today deeply grateful for God, for his family, for all of you, and for the opportunity to serve him, whether it be here or anywhere. I'm grateful that his love is changing my heart from a self-focus to laying down my life intentionally for my brothers and sisters. So that kind of segues into the application. I need to, in review to myself, I need to remember the words of the Lord Jesus from John 13. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set before you this example that you should do what I have done for you. So, hopefully you brought your tub and your towel today and you can just get right to it. Just kidding. To me, this, this means a complete change of my heart and mind that only the Holy Spirit can complete. I can't just will myself to do it no matter how hard I try. And I'm sure you can relate to that because we've all tried. So, I need help. And if someone needs help with their clock toilet, I should be willing to say, yes, Jesus, I love you enough to help someone else unclog their toilet. <laughs> if you need tires for your car, I need to be willing to say, I will help to the best of my ability. So I'll meet you at the door outside. We'll talk about that. Just kidding. No, I actually, I'm not kidding. That's true. I will. And this means that I treat you all with the love and respect that I would like for myself. Jesus, golden rule. If we would just live like that as Americans, wouldn't it solve a lot of problems? So... Finally, I need to be still. Wait till I hear the voice of the Father through the word and prayer and simply obey in faith. And the prayer that I pray for myself and for us. Humble yet almighty Lord, please help me each moment of each day to be still before you, to wait until I hear your voice and to gladly obey. 
please help me and teach me day by day to lay down my life for my brothers and for my sisters in our forever family. Amen. Amen. Good morning. My name is Lynette Sampley, and I'm a ambassador and representative for him, Jesus Christ. My uh, scripture is found in John chapter 3. Um, 17 said God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that through him we might be saved observation we look at the woman caught in adultery we have the woman at the well and we have Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and he saved all of them He said to the woman caught in adultery, where are your accusers? Nowhere, Lord, neither do I condemn you. She was saved and set free, and he told her to continue in the truth that she acquired right there. His love, his forgiveness. She didn't have to carry that past anymore. Woman at the well, she got the best outpouring, the fresh outpouring, like Crystal sang today with us. Living water, she would never thirst anymore. And she was amazed how he knew everything about her. And it didn't bother him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were condemned to death and were cast into the fiery furnace. But when the king looked in there, he saw a fourth man, and he said, it looks like the Son of God. He saved them. Application. We don't have to live in our past anymore. Amen. And learn and know who I am in Christ. Every, every step. And my prayer is our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. This is what Jesus taught those who he had around him. And I also applied his prayer in John chapter 17. He was praying for his beloveds that he daily walked with, shared his heart, shared everything that, that God told him to, to teach them. But he also, in that prayer, prayed for all of us too because we would go through the same things that the disciples would go through so that's my song excellent is there anybody else that has a soap that they would like to share with us this morning okay I'm going to share a soap. I don't get to do this very often. 
or is it too late? Could be problematic. Okay. Daniel, I might may have to get you to muffle her in a minute. Just I haven't started yet. I'll let you know when I start, okay? <laughs> I know this is true for all of you, that there are passages or portions of Scripture that, that grab me every time I read them. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's like... I, I, I read the Old Testament once and the New Testament twice every year. And, and this is a passage in the New Testament that I read twice. And I have, it's been years since I've been able to read this passage without feeling arrested in my heart. And what I mean by that is to stop and, 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 and wait to see what God wants to say. See, Moses was walking on the backside of a desert one day, and he saw a bush on fire. And the fact that the bush was on fire is not what caught his attention. What caught his attention was that it was burning and not consumed. And, and he, said, you know, he said, I'm going to go check this out. So he turned aside to go check it out, and God spoke to him. And I... And and I, I know this is true for you too. When, when we sense that pull, that draw to turn aside, if we don't, we're going to miss something because God is trying to get our attention. I was playing disc golf with, with Harry uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, we're walking on the street, and you know, you know how they put asphalt in cracks and different things? We're walking along. And there's my name. It says D-A-V-E. And I'm thinking, are you trying to get my attention? Out here, out here on the disc golf course? But let me read this passage real quickly. It's four verses, Luke 16, 10 through 13. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust through justice? And if you have not been faithful in, uh, in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No, one, or no, mas no, no servant can serve two masters. Hate the one and love the other. or else he will be loyal to the one and, and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So my observation is this is all about stewardship. Much of the Bible is, is, is a book written to us to be good stewards. We are stewards of so many things. We're stewards of our time. We're, we're stewards of our resources. We're stewards of what we allow to go in the eye gate, the ear gate. The, the Bible is written about learning to be a good and faithful servant or steward of what we have. Verse 10, he was faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he was unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Faithfulness in little things opens the door to stewarding bigger things. How I handle little things will determine, predetermine how I will handle bigger things. Faithfulness in little things is the training ground for, for bigger things. Despise not the day of small beginnings. Faithfulness with a little opens the door for more. If I have not been found faithful with little, the truth is, the reality is, I will not be faithful with much. Verse 11, therefore, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? There is something special about the stewarding of money. Uh, and, and keeping our heart right that opens the door to the stewardship of true riches. 
or the things that, that have eternal significance. How you steward money is actually a measuring stick in the kingdom. Verse 12, and if you've not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? That, that is such a verse of scripture. You know, I, I've thought about this a lot over the last maybe 10 years. Faithfulness is arrived at by stewarding well, maybe initially, what belongs to someone else. And, and that is what leads to or prepares me to have my own. If I am not stewarding well what belongs to someone else, I'm, I'm certainly not in a position to steward well what would be my own. When I first started driving a car, I didn't own one. I would drive my, my parents' car. I did have a motorcycle. It was this, this mighty Suzuki 80. Mean, lean machine. One time I was driving it to Tri-Cities to visit my cousins, and I got against the wind. I couldn't get over 35 miles an hour. <laughs> Cars are honking at me, and I'm pulled over to the side. Anyway, enough about motorcycle days. So when I needed a car, my dad would let me use his car, but he would not let me buy a car, which upset me to no end. What do parents know anyway? You remember that attitude? But, but now I can see his reasoning. Hindsight is me. He wanted to see how well I stewarded his car, and that would be the proving ground to have my own car. One time I went on a, a double date with, with a friend, and we picked up our girlfriends, and we drove the, drove, drove, dragged the gut for a couple hours, and we went to the drive-in and, and uh, got home. <clears throat> In the morning, my dad asked me, he said, how, how did you put 57 miles on my car last night? Now, I was surprised, too. Uh, <laughs> he didn't think I was ready to own my own car yet. And it wasn't until I started putting gas in his car and cleaning, cleaning up any messes that I, that I created in his car and, re, and returned it like that. It was then that he, he, he said, you can, you can buy your own car. God actually looks at how well we are stewarding what belongs to someone else before he gives us our own. It, it, it's in learning to steward well what belongs to someone else that prepares me to steward well what will be my own. You know, I, I begin to think back in my life how many times I've been involved in stewarding stuff that belonged to someone else. Maybe someone else's vision or someone else's ministry. Now, now it's, that's not how I thought of it. I thought of it as my ministry because I was putting my hand to the plow in that place. But, but really, th that is what prepares you for the future. That is what prepares you. If you can steward well what belongs to somebody else, you're starting to get into, into a position for God to give you your own. You know, there are challenges in this place. There, there were challenges. But see, all kingdom issues are heart issues. And God uses those times to deal with things in our heart to prepare us for what he wants to pour out upon our lives. Verse 13, no servant can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, the word money is not interchangeable with the word mammon. The word mammon means wealth personified. Jesus is actually talking about the spirit behind something. He is addressing mammon as more than dollars and cents because money itself is not evil. It is not bad. It is not wrong. It is the love of money that opens the door for all the evil. Mammon and the love of money are probably more interchangeable. Money is just a means to an end. It's just a commodity. All of us need and use money every day. Mammon is evil. 
It is a principality. It is the power behind, that works behind world economics to enslave people to possessions, to bring them into servitude. Proverbs says the borrower is servant to the lender. Its aim is to bring people into captivity through covetousness and greed. Notice I'm not looking at you, darling. Yeah, okay. So just let me clarify some things. God is not opposed to you owning things. He is opposed to things owning you. He is not opposed to, to, he's opposed to them having a hold on you. And that is the issue. Jesus always goes after the heart. We cannot serve God and mammon. When we turn and put supreme value on money or the things that money can buy, we have actually dethroned God in our lives. And we have stepped into idolatry. Colossians 3.5 tells us that covetousness is idolatry. But here's the thing. You can be guilty of the love of money and not own a thing. You can be a homeless person living on the street and yet be filled with covetousness. Or you can be someone who does have some things and not be guilty of the love of money. It's not about what kind of car you drive or what kind of house you live in. It's all about heart issues. God is after your heart. These verses are actually talking about the heart. My application for this really was just asking these questions of myself. What are the things that God has given me to be faithful? Areas that, that um, I have my hands on right now. What areas am I not moving forward in because I, I've not been faithful? Am, am I stewarding my heart to keep God first place because covetousness dethrones God in my life? I can see areas in my life where God has brought increase through faithfulness. And, and I bet you can too in your life. Am I possibly blind to other areas <laughs> that I have not been faithful with? Am I stewarding the true riches that, that, that he's entrusted me with? My prayer is this. Lord, I, I choose to fully embrace your lordship. I want you to be my heart. I want to serve you and only you. Help me to be a good steward. Help me to be found faithful in stewarding even the little things so that those things can increase in my life. Lord, expose my heart. Show me any areas of unfaithfulness. Help me to recognize the things that I steward that, that maybe belong to somebody else so that I will, again, be a good steward in, in all these fronts, in, in all these areas. Lord, I, I long to hear you say these words. Well done good and faithful servant you were faithful over a few things i will make you ruler over many things enter into the joy of your lord father my, my heart longs to hear that in jesus name amen amen how well did i steward that time Oh, my goodness. That's in Fort Walla Walla. Anyway, that's a special spot. If you wonder if God's speaking to you or not, head down there. And, and But can you see how that would have freaked me out as I'm walking along with Harry and, and all of a sudden I see my name? Yeah. All right. Why don't we stand together? Do you have a closing song or... We, it doesn't it's not necessary or okay um let, let's just close in prayer just put your hands on your heart just say father 
I am your child. I get to hear your voice. My ears are open. My heart is receptive. Help me to walk in your ways. Help me to live in your truth. And help me to express your love to everyone that I come in contact with. Father, in this weekend that we celebrate liberty, thank you, someone was with me. <laughs> we want to celebrate the liberty that you poured into each one of our lives the most, God. We celebrate it today. Thank you for the freedom that you've given. Let our lives express that to everyone we come in contact with today. In Jesus' name. God, now, now I realize God knew that. In Jesus' name. Okay, my wife has a quick announcement. Then she's going to release you. Hey, I just wanted to give everybody an update. We sent out an email and asked for prayer for my mom. And so thank you for that. And so quickly after that went out, found out that she doesn't have septus, sepsis. Sorry. So that was done that same day, and I just got a phone call from the hospital while we were finishing up. See, right while you were talking, the Lord had someone call me, so I just left. Thank you. So. You're his favorite. <laughs> so anyhow, so the nurse says she's completely been extubated, and she's fine. She's, she's good. She's the ever-ready bunny. But I just wanted to say thank you guys so much for praying. Just what a beloved family I have in you. And I tell my mom, Mom, there's people you haven't even met yet that are praying for you. She goes, well, tell them all thank you. And I said, okay. So anyhow, so Lord bless you guys. We love you so much. Thank you for coming and spending time with us as we worship the Lord and hear the word, great words this morning, you guys. Thank you so much. It so encourages us when we get to hear what the Lord has put on your heart. So thank you for sharing that with us. Be blessed. Have a wonderful week in the Lord and with your family and friends. Amen. Bye-bye.